The Gentle Art of Tramping, Chapter Seventeen, The Tramp as Cook. Then did he study some half hour, but as the comic saith, his heart was in the kitchen. I think Coleridge was annoyed by the man who interrupted him with the words, "Them's the jockeys for me," referring to some steak puddings which had been brought before his eyes. Coleridge was regarding some choice bit of Scottish scenery, the Falls of Clyde, I think, and a rough, unlikely-looking fellow had used what Coleridge had considered absolutely the right objective concerning them, majestic, and the poet turned on him to learn more of this verbal grace. Then a toad leapt from the mouth of the princess who had previously given a pearl. "Them's the jockeys for me," said he, regarding the steak puddings. It is recorded somewhere in Coleridge's table talk. I read it some twenty or twenty-five years ago, and the two expressions have remained with me: majestic and "them's the jockeys." In fact, I adopted the words "majestic" as applied to scenery there and then. That and the Shakespearean majestical. It seemed I did him wrong, being so majestical. It had almost become a vice of style. That, however, is by the way, the poetry of our life. And of our book shall be interlarded with, I may not say puddings, one does not lard with puddings, with the fatness of cooking and eating. The dawn stars make one hungry, noontide makes one hunger, and so does afternoon. The tramp is loath to tighten his belt. I have described in another book how one should make coffee, and I will not repeat. But the first thing about it is love, as I wrote in a verse during my tramp with Vachel Lindsay. Coffee should be made with love; that's the first ingredient. And the chief cause of coffee being just indifferent is your indifference towards the coffee. I feel this is also true of the most of cooking. You must bring a loving heart to the premise or the campfire. No soured personality can be trusted to stir the beans. Far less make the coffee. I have not examined the psychology of good cooks, but I imagine few of them are bitter, few of them are egoists. Watch a thoroughgoing egoist over the campfire cooking for you. But I ask too much. Take the pan from him. Take the pot away. He will be saying to you, "I had a very interesting letter from Thomas Hardy, a propos of a letter I wrote to the Times, approving entirely what I said." Meanwhile, the coffee pot has tilted on its stone, and it is pouring its goodness to the ants and the beetles. It is a minching malesho; it means mischief. You must take over from him. Let him sit himself on a rock and pour forth, but not tend the fire and let the coffee pot pour forth. Lindsay wrote a reply to my recipe for making coffee. His was a recipe for making tea. He did not omit love, but as well as tea leaves, he recommended leaves of various books to be put in the pot. I do not know if that I care for this tea from book leaves, and I suppose old bindings. I have had it indoors, given to me by some dusty recluse in his portentous library. Quay tea it was not so excellent. Quay soporific it was good. One may put it in a little philosophy, however, with both tea and coffee. Hast any philosophy in thee, shepherd? We need a little for our repast, but we want no soda to bring out the flavour. Lindsay, being an American, knew little of tea. That is why we travelled almost exclusively on coffee. In any case, a practical detail to be noted: it is not wise to make coffee and tea from the same pot. The flavours adhere even. To a very well rinsed vessel and spoil one another. If there are two of you, each may carry his own pot, one for tea, one for coffee. But it is simpler to be unanimous as regards the choice of beverage. In Russia, I tramped almost always on tea, because the tea is so good there and needs no milk. In some districts, milk is difficult to obtain. In America, however, evaporated and condensed milk. In a can is obtainable everywhere, and is conveniently carried. You need only make two tiny perforations in the lid of the condensed milk tin. 
You blow through one, and it drives a thin stream of milk out of the other. You cover these perforations with a leaf or a piece of paper, and thus seal. The can is carried safely in the rucksack. Of course, if you open with a can opener, it is likely to be difficult to keep your milk for more than one meal, or to make an unpleasant mixture in your rucksack. China tea has the advantage that it needs no milk. Indeed, milk spoils it. It should be made very weak, and it is then more refreshing than Indian tea. I prefer a good Chinese blend, especially on a tramp. It is not, however, possible to prepare tea in any elegant fashion. There is no five o'clock in the wilds. You brew a pot of tea at any hour which taste suggests. The luxurious may carry a small teapot and merely boil the water in the can or coffee pot, but the rougher method is not without appeal. You can shift two spoonfuls of tea into your coffee pot when the water is boiling, and at once take it off with the fire. The better plan is to cut off a small square from your mosquito netting and tie the tea in that. Your first mugful will be rather weak, but your second, third, and fourth progressively stronger unless you are able to pull out the little bag of swollen tea leaves. Wash the bit of netting and is ready for the next time. It will last several weeks if you do not lose it. I find you can walk further after tea, but coffee makes you more sociable. You talk more after coffee. If Mrs. Thrale had made the great doctor coffee instead of tea, Boswell would have missed much more of what he said. Though tea indoors is very different from tea outdoors, as a domestic drink it is productive of high spirits, but out of doors it enkindles purpose. You walk and think and are silent. It is good for artists and writers. Forms and ideas ride unbidden to the mind. What good thinking comes after the morning tea on the road? Whole chapters, whole stories, curious conceits and fancies. But after coffee you cannot keep anything to yourself. And if you have no companion, you take to singing. If, however, you are very tired or wet through with rain, coffee has more power to restore. It is better, then, to make it without milk. But several or eight lumps of sugar in the pot, and heat water and sugar together, not too much water. When quite hot, sizzling, float a double portion or even a treble portion of coffee on the top. Do not, for this potation, use mosquito netting. The coffee should then be watched, for it may rise suddenly and become wasted. It is as well to stir it. And then, a useful device is the using of cross sticks. If you make a sign of the cross over a pot of coffee, but not boil over, say the cowboys. And it's a curious fact that two dead twigs placed crosswise over the top of the coffee pot seem to cast a spell on the brew. The brew should simmer for a quarter of an hour or more. Then add a little cold water and stir up. The grouts will go to the bottom, leaving a fine liqueur. Though very strong, this type of coffee is not bitter. You sip it, it lasts a long while. It is much better than medicine for you, and will drive away any amounts of damp from your system. I think it is better than coffee and rum, or worn damsome gin, or any of the concomitants of aspirin. No tramp should carry aspirin. It is depressing to mind and soul, and generally causes you to give up adventures. Bread and cheese and coffee make a good combination, as of course do cake and coffee, any sort of coffee and cake. Bread and sardine and coffee go down well. To say nothing of fried trout, directly you get your fish, scrape it and clean it, a dirty job, but you get used to it. Wash it and fry it. If you can eat it within a quarter of an hour, of its swimming in the stream, you can get some of the hidden and lost potentialities of trout. The inner worth of those delightful pink spots, those scales your colour-loving eyes loathe to scrape. However, remember the coffee. It can simmer gently while you fry. Bully beef is redeemed by coffee. So is macanochi. Eggs go well, but they must be fried. Boiled eggs go better with tea. Wash them, and then boil them in the same water from which you will make your tea. It improves the tea. Be careful the eggs as they boil, that they do not dance together and crack one another. For in that case, your tea water will be spoiled. In Poland, and in border states, and in Russia, there are excellent hard bannocks which soften when heated. You slit them, and insert butter. In Russia, they are called babliki. 
They sell them in the east end of all great cities. They go remarkably well with tea. In Scotland, Norway, Denmark, Sweden and Finland, there are excellent oaten and rye cakes. They are delightful with Indian tea and milk, not so good with China tea. America, marvellous country, provides the greatest variety of breakfast foods, cakes and pies in the world. What can compare with pumpkin pie, blackberry pie, peach pie? You can go into an unromantic-looking ville or berg and surely come away with an unbroken round of pie to civilise the camp cuisine. On a long tramping expedition, one is bound to study to some degree the body and its needs. The army marches on its stomach, and so do you. An attack of indigestion can make a strong man almost too weak to move. Beware of the cakes sold in the marketplace in Mohammedan cities. What in Central Asia the Sarts and the Uzbeks bake. They are difficult to swallow, even with wine, and once inside become a stiff, indigestible mass. Millet bread is also difficult to assimilate. Maize flour bread is also, upon occasion, bad to tramp on. On the other hand, no harm comes from any variety of wheaten and oaten biscuits. One of the tramp's temptations is towards wild fruit. He can easily make himself very unwell by eating unripe or bitter fruit, even when boiled with sugar. Again, if the coffee pot gets dirty, inside and brown curds are here to the side, you will find you are drinking something rather upsetting with your coffee. There is no need to scrub the outside of the coffee pot, but cleanliness within should be de rigueur. Dried apricots, when attainable, are ideal to take on a tramp, but they should be washed before cooking. The stones should be broken and the kernels thrown in with the fruit and the sugar. The added flavour is all that one needs. Potatoes are difficult to carry, but when obtained can be easily cooked under the seemingly dead ashes of your campfire. They are greatly enjoyed, as all know who have even on a picnic roasted them and dandled them timorously in their fingers. It is just as well to hoist them out of the ashes on the end of a sharpened stick. If the stick will not go in, the potatoes are probably not yet cooked. Similarly, Various birds, having been plucked of feathers, can be cooked under ashes. The fire ought to have been burning an hour or so, and have accumulated much ember before cooking a bird is tried. But a hollow may be found for your chicken, and the ashes carefully raked and heaped over it. Perhaps, however, the best way to cook a young chicken is to fry it. It is easily fried over with glowing embers and immensely tasty. Chicken with a tang of wood smoke is a feast. One cannot think of having a chicken every day, but enough has been said to show that the cuisine of the outdoors life is not utterly primitive. There is a variety of good things for those who are not aesthetics. And besides all these good things, there enter by chance into the menage mushrooms, so shockingly overlooked by town-bred folk, Wine, especially the van de pay, which is sometimes almost a free gift to the wanderer. Honey, just taken from the, the bee. Devonshire cream, if you are in the English West Country. And also bountiful cider. There are good cheeses, though out of doors, all cheese is good. You can take your fresh Petit Suisse along with you in France. Your Gruyere, your Stilton. There is some good cheese in every country and all manner of rough cream cheeses in the mountains. Goat milk cheese is apt to make one very thirsty, so one should have wine to go with it. In America there is the never-to-be-forgotten strawberry shortcake. You can also get a brick of ice cream, though it soon melts. In Turkish villages you can go into the restaurants and lift such delicacies as stuffed peppers. Even the thought of them is an appetizer. The bon viveur can carry with him his petit verre, Upon my honour, this tramping business is not altogether an eating of roots in the desert. Still, when provisions run out, and you are far from human habitation, you may be reduced to eating grass. That is the reverse side of the picture. The following recipe for the making of flapjacks was sent to me by Miss Anne Kindersley of the Girls' Guides. Go to sleep very early the night before, as the jacks always take longer to mix than you have imagined. Wanted a frying pan or a Dixie lid, a billy can or a basin to do the mixing in. 
butter, lard or grease of some sort. Self-raising flour, according to the quantity of flapjacks you are prepared to consume, pepper, salt, water. Unless by any happy chance the milk has turned sour in the night, it can then be used as a substitute for the water without any fear of extravagance. Mix the flour lightly with the milk or water and a seasoning of salt. Knead into dough and roll out as flat as possible. Gut, pull or carve into separate cakes or shapes as the fancy takes you. Toss into the melted grease in the frying pan and flap until both sides are frizzled and lovely brown. Then quickly consume with a little pepper and salt according to taste. It is advisable not to remove traces of the flour from your face and hands until you have fried and eaten the flapjack. This sounds very good. There is space for further recipes in the blank pages at the end of the book.